All right. Thank you, Sandy and Gabriella. The, um, they got tired of my finding karaoke music, I think. So, but we thank, thank you for uh, coming forward with the worship. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, what should be a children's message. And so if the children will come to that first row right there, any, all of you, not all at once, there, all of you are going at once. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need your help here. You know, as as I tune to radio stations, you know, you have you go through the static. Okay, the problem is that you 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 don't hear any of the music you were after, right? But when you turn the dial, you keep coming to a spot where you can listen, because you're listening for that one station, right? That you're tuning it to. So this morning we're going to talk about listening to God. We want to be careful listeners and not let other things get in the way. Later today, we're going to be talking about a person, a young person named Samuel. He had been sent to the temple to learn about being a priest. And so I'm going to see how good of a listener you are. Okay, it's, it's kind of a test, but we got this. Okay, each time I say the name Samuel, I need you to jump up and say, here I am. Okay, now you, you don't scream, here I am. You don't yell, here I am. Just jump up and say, here I am, and then sit down again. Okay, but you got to listen because every time I say Samuel, you get to try and do it. Okay, so we'll see whether you can do that or not. Are you ready? Here we go. Samuel yeah, was a young person who loved God and did what God asked. Samuel lived at the temple with Eli, the minister. One night while sleeping, Samuel heard a voice calling his name. He ran to Eli and said, here I am. Eli was very sleepy. He yawned and said, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Then Samuel... Mm -hmm. heard a voice calling his name again. He ran to Eli and said, here I am. And Eli was still very sleepy. And he, he yawned and said, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. For the third time, Samuel mm -hmm, heard his name. He ran to Eli and said, here I am. This time, Eli realized that God was trying to speak to Samuel. Mm -hmm. Eli told him to say, speak, God. I'm listening. One more time, Samuel heard a voice calling his name, and he said, Speak, God, I am listening. And God told Samuel many important things. Samuel learned a valuable lesson and listened to the Lord that night and every night for the rest of his life. And I thank you for helping out with this. See, God wants us to hear what he's saying. But it's no use just sitting and listening for just something, just for anything. Like the radio needs to be tuned in, we need to be tuned in to God. To hear what he's saying to us. How can we do that? Stay tuned into God. Well we can do it through studying our Bible. We can regularly pray to God. And ask the Holy Spirit to help us listen carefully. See when God talks to us. And we're tuned into him to listen. We'll hear clearly what it is that he's asking us to do. Rather than just the static. So why don't we um, close out the children's message here with a prayer. Father God. We thank you that Samuel was um, such a testimony to the idea of listening for your voice, listening to hear when you call. And Father, just like tuning a radio and we get to static and finally we tune to just that right station, it's because we're listening really hard. Father, I just ask that you would help us to remember the times when we, we need to talk to you, the times we need to hear from you. It's just as important that we need to be ready to listen when we do hear you. And we thank you for this lesson this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And all the children may go back to their seats. Singular or plural. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, on November 13, 1946, a, a plane took off from uh, Skinnick to the county, uh, county airport with a rather unique payload, six pounds of dry ice. The pilot was Vincent Joseph Schaefer, a chemist and a meteorologist. His mission? He was going to try and seed the clouds with pellets of carbon dioxide in the hope of creating enough condensation to cause rain and snow. And upon takeoff, Schaefer flew his single propeller plane over Mount Greylock in Massachusetts into a giant cumulus cloud and dumped his load of dry ice. Eyewitnesses on the ground said the clouds seemed to explode and the snowfall that fell was visible for 40 miles. See, Vincent Schaefer had just produced the very first snowstorm ever initiated by man. 
You know, we're in a series, or finishing a series today, in fact, a series called Win the Day. It's the idea of having seven daily habits that we can put into place to thrive, not just to survive every day, but to actually thrive every day. It's based on a book by, the, by that title. The author was uh, Pastor Mark Batterson. And this idea of seeding the clouds, if you will, is our final habit. Our first habit, you know, we had the section about burying our dead yesterdays. The first one is flip the script. If you want to change your life, you have to change your life story, how you perceive it and how others perceive it. Secondly, kiss the waves. The obstacle is not the enemy. It's the way through. And then we looked at winning the day. The third lesson, eat the frog. If you want God to do the super, then you've got to do the natural. Fourth lesson was fly the kite. How you handle the little things is how you handle anything in life. Our third section and final section is imagine the unborn tomorrows. Imagine what could be in our life. The fifth lesson or habit was cut the rope because playing it safe is risky. Sometimes we think it's the opposite, but playing it safe is usually the riskiest gambit to take. The sixth habit is wind the clock. Time is measured in minutes, but life is measured in moments. And today we get to our seventh habit, our final habit of seed the clouds. In other words, sowing today what you want to see tomorrow. And now, now they may sound kind of a name it, claim it kind of thing, and I'm not going there at all. What I'm saying is that if we want to see the best from God, we need to be praying to God and seeking his will and his um, explaining of how our life is to be. If you want to win the day, you can't wish upon a star. You have to seed the clouds with prayer. Don't underestimate the power of a single seed, a single prayer. It has the power to change anything, power to change everything. In fact, those other six habits are meaningless if we don't envelop them all in prayer. The science of seeding clouds is maybe a, a modern day marvel, but the idea is as old as the prophet Elijah. After a famine that lasted three and a half years, Elijah seeded the clouds with a brave prayer. It was not a simple, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food type of prayer. Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. You know, we have a, a prayer chain here at the church and it's called Maranatha Camel Knees and it's a really strange name. But it, the idea that camels kneel so much in their lifetimes, their knees are calloused from having to be kneeling and kneeling is where we really truly need to be. When was the last time you found yourself doubled over like that in prayer? Not just saying a, a quick little hi to God and then moving on. The posture that Elijah assumes indicates profound humility and an extreme intensity in his prayer. He wanted to hear from God. Elijah was seeding the clouds in his day. Let me double back to Elijah one more time. At first, there was no visible evidence of God answering his prayer for rain. And that's when most of us give up. But Elijah, he doubled down. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went and up and looked, and there's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, well, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising from the sea. See, our intimacy with God, our impact on the world around us, must begin and end with not only talking to God, but truly listening to him as well. And today we're going to look at what that looks like. But I want to start off with a little brain teaser. Now, I, I have a disclaimer. If you've heard this before, please don't ruin it for everybody else and blurt out the answer. But I, here, here it comes, the teaser for you. Listen carefully. You're driving a bus. You go east 12 miles. You turn south and go two miles and take on nine passengers. Then you turn west and go three miles and let off four passengers. My question for you is, how old is the bus driver? It's a rather strange question for the facts that we're given, right? The main problem that many people have when trying to answer this brain teaser is listening. A lot of the times we latch onto certain information that we think is important and then somehow miss the most important part of the, of the question. Like you probably did when I first read this question this morning, I latched onto the directions. Well, he went east and then, and then south and then west, tried to keep track of that the number of miles driven, the number of passengers that came on the bus. Those are the things that are important, right? 
But when I got to the end and it asked how old the bus driver is, I thought, how are we going to find the age of the bus driver from the facts that we are given? I took a minute, I looked at the numbers, wondered maybe if there was some secret message in the numbers or if we added them together or multiplied and subtracted, the, I don't know. Maybe if you added something together, it would work, but it didn't. And it wasn't for a few moments that I realized that the clue to this teaser was quite simple. It was a three letter word. And in fact, it started the whole puzzle off. It said, you are the bus driver. Now you know the age of the bus driver. But we're listening not for certain elements, the elements we think are coming. How often is it thought that we have the same problem with listening in real life? Listening is so important in life and crucial to making relationships work. And that includes the relationship with Jesus. We all have built in, us into the need and want to be listened to. Being listened to communicates things like worth and value and love and respect. How do you feel when you're pouring your heart out to somebody only to find out they weren't even listening to you? Well, you feel hurt. You feel upset, like they don't even care about you. Listening is so important, yet we live in a day and an age where there are so many distractions to listening that it makes it more and more difficult to do. If we consider how to go deeper and deeper into a relationship with Jesus Christ, so many people talk about prayer and reading the Bible and serving others and all kinds of great, wonderful things, but not a lot of people mention listening to God. Again, listening is so important in any relationship, but especially a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus. How often do we read our Bibles, the actual word of God, but yet just have it go in one ear and out the other? How often do we pray by just throwing up all these requests to God, but yet never take time to listen to what he may say in return? Why is that? I think there's several reasons. First, I think a lot of it is because of how busy and crazy our lives are. Our schedules are slow, so loaded up with thing after thing after thing and, the, and those things we consider important that we don't ever take time to just stop and listen to God. In Psalm 46.10, the writer says, Be still and know that I am God. How often do we just take time to sit still and just listen to God? Second, just like what I described about the brain teaser, I think we're all too often focused on the wrong things. I think a lot of times if, if we thought about God speaking to us, how do we think of that? We tend to think of everything in grand terms like flashes of lightning and booms and thunder and clouds and smoke. There'd be angels singing and trumpets blasting, all the things that would sit us up and take notice saying, okay, God, you got my attention now. Sometimes God does use dramatic things to get our attention. He spoke to Moses from a burning bush, speaks to a guy named Balaam through his donkey, and he speaks to Joseph and Mary through angels. But more often than not, they are the exceptions. And instead, God speaks to us in quiet, simple ways. There's another great story about Elijah in 1 Kings. He's on a mountaintop waiting for God to come so they could speak. And as he's on the mountain, a mighty windstorm hits the mountain. But it says God is not in the wind. After that, there was a big earthquake. But again, it says God was not in the earthquake. And after that, there was a fire. But again, no God. Finally, it says there was a gentle whisper. And Elijah came out of the cave he was waiting in and spoke to God. Yes, sometimes he speaks in grandiose ways. Other times he's just speaking in small, quiet whispers to us. God, I think, most often speaks to us in very simple ways. Through his words of the Bible, he speaks through other people, he speaks through our conscience. But we're all too often looking for the big, huge message when in fact he's already talking and we just aren't listening. Thirdly, I think we miss God's message so often because we've forgotten what God actually sounds like. In the midst of all the voices and the messages that we take in every day, it's hard to pick God's voice out of it all. This is especially hard if we're not spending any time with him to recognize his voice. Think of it this way. What's the best way to learn a foreign language? Right now, my granddaughter is learning Spanish. And to do so, she's doing a lot of repetition, right? Repetition is the easiest way to learn a second language. Spending time listening to it and then repeating what you hear and then listening to it again. If you do that for a time, though, and you take a break, coming back to it can be difficult because you can't remember as much. I think it works the same way with us listening to God. If we're not spending time reading his word and just hanging out with God, his words and language will become foreign to us and we'll miss things because we just don't understand anymore. 
finally, I think the last thing that prevents us from listening to God is because we just simply don't want to. For the rest of our time today, though, I want to take a look at a passage, the passage we described in the children's message this morning, that will give us some more insight into listening to God in our lives. 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 says, Meanwhile, okay, we don't have to shout out Samuel now. Okay, 1 Samuel 3, what you were waiting on that, weren't you? Yeah. 1 Samuel 3, 1, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare, and visions were quite uncommon. Now some people might see that verse and, and, and believe that maybe God wasn't speaking to many people back then in, in Samuel's day. But I think the root of the problem was that the people had given up listening a long time before that. In the chapters that precede what we just read, read about, it talks about Eli's wicked sons, how they had no respect for the Lord God. But I think the root of the problem was Again, they gave up listening. They did whatever they wanted and didn't care about the work that God had called them to. Have you ever wondered why children growing up in the church today reject the church so later on in life? Well, here's two gentlemen who did that, his sons. They just ignored him and what he was saying. That is why the messages from the Lord were rare and visions were uncommon. It wasn't that God wasn't speaking. It was the fact that no one was listening. No one was ready to relay the message that God had for the rest of his people. Therefore, it seemed that God was silent for years and years, but it was really just no one listening for his word. I think the same is true for our time today. I think God is speaking all the time to many people, but for the most part, we just don't listen. I think the same is true for our, uh, all of our time. What qualities in Samuel's life made him, I wonder, able to hear for the voice of God? I see at least four qualities in this passage. That's where we can seek for ourselves. Number one, Samuel had a servant's heart. Jewish historian Josephus states that Samuel was about 12 years old when he got this call from God. At the, his tasks were to light the candles, tend to the furnishings, and general housekeeping in the tabernacle. Not exactly the exciting parts of being at the tabernacle. But nonetheless, they still had to be done. Compare this to Eli's sons. They grew up in the tabernacle, saw their father administer the worship. But in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 2, we read that Eli's sons were wicked men who, again, had no regard for God. What a contrast. They grew up in the same house. They watched the same man, watched Eli, observing the same sacred items, yet two totally different outcomes. You know, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. If that's true, why do we see and hear children doing just that? That, that verse actually bothered me and troubled me, along with countless parents I knew with wayward children. But I think the verse should read more like this, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, it will not leave him. See, there is definitely a parent's role. Hannah and her husband were faithful in worship. The word says, Hannah prayed for her son, Samuel. Hannah monitored her son's growth. Eli, it says, knew his sons well. He was willing to confront their sins even in chapter 2. But there's also the child's role as well. Notice the attitude of the sons. Eli's was no regard for the things of the Lord. Samuel was a life of servanthood to God. It is said that God has no grandchildren. In other words, you cannot become a child of God by being a child of godly parents. There comes a time when children must take responsibility for their actions. And if we recognize this two-step approach, the parent's active role and a child's submissive attitude, we'll be able to claim that promise of Proverbs 22. So firstly, Samuel had a servant's heart. Second, Samuel had a good reputation. It said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 26, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew taller and grew in favor with the Lord, with the people. Do you recognize those words from another time? These are the same words used to describe Jesus as a young man. Luke 2, 52, Jesus also grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with all the people. Why is our reputation so important? Simply put, how people see us is how they see God. Our actions reflect our leader. That's why Jesus had such trouble with the Pharisees. They were representatives of God, yet their reputation for rituals and rules was anything but properly representing God's grace. And reputation has to be formed. The statement is made that a reputation is not formed in one day. 
but a reputation can be destroyed in one minute. It's formed by living a consistent life before God. You know, Billy Graham was one of the most respected men in the world time, in the world, I should say, for my entire lifetime. With so many scandals hitting church leaders back then and now and all of that above, Graham remained untarnished. Why is that? Graham, it said, among other things, had three laws of integrity. First law, he will never be the first person to enter a hotel room. Second law, he will never eat dinner with a woman other than his wife. Third law, he'll never be in a car alone with a woman other than his wife. Samuel is an example of how a good reputation makes one available to use by God. Thirdly, Samuel was obedient to authority. Three times Samuel thought he heard the voice of Eli, and three times he went to see what he wanted. When we're obedient, we are able to hear God's voice. This may seem simple, but it can be difficult to answer God's call. So many things call out for our attention. And obedience is an unnatural response, isn't it? Few of us enjoy being told what to do. Our natural response is to be in control. But being in control is when pride can take over. Don Shula, a former head coach of the Miami Dolphins, tells of a time he went on vacation. He took it in Maine during the offseason. He wanted to go someplace far away from Miami where he could go and relax without people recognizing him. When they arrived at the resort, it was raining, so he and his wife decided to go to a movie in town. And when they arrived at the theater, the house lights were on, and he was surprised how small the crowd was for that movie. Yet when he walked in, he was also surprised to receive a round of applause from all the patrons. They took their seat and waited for the movie to start. Secretly surprised, Shula leaned over to his wife and said, I guess there's nowhere I can go where I can't be recognized. About that time, a man came over and with a friendly smile shook hands with Shula and his wife. Shula said, I'm surprised you all know us. Should we know you? We're just glad you came in. See, the manager said he wouldn't start the film until there were at least 10 people to watch it. <laughs> Humility is a big thing. Samuel was obedient because he was humble. Even though Samuel was not receiving answers from Eli, he continued to be obedient to his mentor's instructions. And Samuel was obedient to his instructions from God. What did he say? He said, speak, for your servant is listening. I can imagine those are some of the sweetest words the Lord can hear come from our mouth. Speak, your servant is listening. I don't know what you want to do with me, but speak, for your servant is listening. I don't know how I can be of any use to you, but speak, your servant is listening. I'm anxious and concerned about the future, but speak, for your servant is listening. When Samuel made himself available, he was truly ready to receive God's instructions. We also must find our obedience in the Lord, even when he seems not to answer us. You know, we think God doesn't answer our prayers, but the reality is the word assures us God always answers our prayers. We just may not get the answer we were expecting or hoped for, or at the time we expected it, but he always answers. See, when the situation is not right, God says no. And when you are not right, God says grow. When the time is not right, God says go slowly. When you move at God's speed, you'll always reach your destination on time. And when everything is finally right, God says go. And it's at that point, God, that you serve will open doors that no man can possibly shut. Fourthly, Samuel was willing to listen. We're discussing winning each day, and that includes eagerly anticipating God's working in our lives. Eli, finally realizing Samuel was being called by God, now gives him instructions to prepare for God's call. He says in verse 9, so he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. Go back to your room and lie down until he calls again. Waiting. Have you ever been in God's waiting room and found it exciting and exult? No, when we're in God's waiting room, it's quite frustrating, isn't it? Now, see, my doctor... And Loma Linda is a really great doctor. He will sit there and answer, uh, answer, I should say, every single question that I put forth. It's really great. To, but the problem is he patiently answers every question of all the other parents, uh, patients too, not their parents, but their patients. The longest I have sat in his waiting room is literally one and a half hours waiting for my scheduled appointment time because I knew he was in there patiently working with the other patients. 
But as frustrating as that was, I know he won't go home until he sees every patient, including me. It's even more frustrating in God's waiting room since the stakes are so much higher. Waiting to be used, waiting to be encouraged, waiting for an answer to our prayers. But I also know he will never leave me and all of my prayers will be answered in his timing. He says, if he calls you again, anticipation, it carries with it the idea of expectation. We need to expect that God is seeking our good and therefore he will answer our prayers. The greatest tragedy in life is that prayers go unanswered because they often go unasked in the first place. The true statement, or no truer statement, I guess, God won't answer 100% of the prayers that you don't pray. I'm amazed at the number of people who don't expect God to do great things. We pray and our prayers are answered and we say, oh, what a great coincidence that was. We put God first in our finances and then when our needs are met, we're shocked by how that worked out. 1 Corinthians 2.9 said, That is what the scriptures mean when they say, No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. See, God is always speaking to his people. The key is we want, must want to listen as well. Said a music teacher once asked her class, What's the difference between listening and hearing? At first there was no response, and finally, finally a hand went way up in the back, and one of the young people offered this wise definition, listening is wanting to hear. We can be hearing all the time, but unless we want to hear for certain things, we're not listening. Do you want to hear God? Listening for God requires a, a servant's heart, requires a good reputation, and obedience to his authority, and the ability to be ready to listen. Jesus himself used an illustration of listening for the voice of God. I love this passage. John 10, 1 to 5 says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gates for him and the sheep recognize his voice and they come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll run from him because they don't know his voice. Do you know your Savior's voice? Are you listening for it today? If so, God wants to speak to you, not only today, but every day of our lives. And that is how we win the day for him. Let us pray.